you ask yourself, well, what's the limit of that? Because that's the religious question, fundamentally, is, well, if you took on all the responsibility you could take on, and you faced everything that you needed to face, what would you be like? Who would you be? And how would the world transform around you? And, well, if, if the partial answer is, well, if I do that a little bit, things get a fair bit better, then the next question might be, well, what if you did that completely? And I don't think that's possible in some sense, right? It's like, you know, perfection is a horizon that always recedes, but it isn't obvious to me what the upper limit of that is. And certainly we do see people, I mean, saints, who kind of push the limit and they miraculous things happen around them, maybe in the literal sense, and if not in the literal sense, close enough, you know, for all intents and purposes. And so that's heartening. Father Dave became president of Franciscan University of Steubenville in 2019, the first Franciscan alumnus to lead the university. Father Dave also earned a Master of Divinity, an MA in Theology, a Doctorate in Education, an Executive Juris Doctorate. He is a member of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, province of the Franciscan Third Order Regular. He was ordained a priest in 1996, a well-known Catholic speaker, an author, Father Dave has written seven books and produced several evangelistic films and video series, including Sign of Contradiction, Metanoia, and Letters to Myself from the End of the World, through the Ministry of the Wild Goose. On much of your life, you have been searching for certainty, and then you pivot very quickly to speak about suffering. So maybe two questions. Your search for certainty how has that brought you to what you spoke about earlier this evening? And why did you make such a quick pivot to talk about suffering? If you're looking for certainty, the reality of suffering is certain. I mean, what do you accept as evidence above all else? That's a good question, that's a hard question, but I would say pain is up there. It's very difficult not to believe in the reality of your own pain. Um, it's somewhat easier not to believe in the reality of other people's pain. That's not so easy either, you know, um, but it's, your pain seems to be undeniably real. And so it does beg a question, which is, you know, if pain is undeniably real, is that which overcomes pain even more real? And I think that's, in some sense, that's the idea that lurks behind the idea of the resurrection. When, when Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert, I'm very compelled by that story. You know? So for example, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that the story begins with a tyrannical state and then it's the Spirit of God that leads the Hebrews. Maybe it's the Spirit of God that characterizes the Hebrew longing for freedom. And that's kind of an interesting idea, you know, psychologically. You think that, what's the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is that which manifests itself within you in opposition to tyranny. Could be, you know, that's, that's not a bad, idea, it's quite an idea, it's a remarkable idea, um, and maybe it's true. It's certainly the case that that's how God is presented in that story, and in many other ways, but, but that being paramount. Uh, above all, and you know, there's, a, there's an, another corollary to that, which is, well, we shouldn't be subjects of tyranny if we're children of God, and for Israel, and Israel means we who struggle with God, it's not appropriate for us to be subject to tyranny. And that's interesting too, because I think we, we, we sort of accept that idea at face value in the West. Yeah, slavery is wrong, obviously. It's like, it's not so bloody obvious, these things. You know, one of the things that I'm really curious about in relationship to the postmodern types who make group membership the sign one on of existence is, why is slavery wrong? 
exactly. It's like it's just one, if we're all groups and one group lords it over another, it's like, that's not wrong. It's just tough luck for the, for the oppressed group. It's, there's no wrong there because it's only wrong if we're sovereign individuals, right, with some intrinsic worth who are not to be subject to arbitrary tyranny. That's when it's wrong. And you have to accept all those other axioms before you get to say anything about slavery being wrong at all. Otherwise, it's just, hey, like Marx pointed out, it's just brute economics. And so you can make a moral judgment about that if you want, but what's your criteria for saying that it's wrong? You know, and of course, that would upset people on the radical left who want to presume that it's intrinsically wrong without having to presume all the things that you have to presume to make it intrinsically wrong, and without even noticing that that's just a sleight of hand. In any case, so that's part of that biblical narrative too. We're not the sorts of creatures who should be subject to tyranny. And then the tyranny might be, well, is it the tyranny of a state? Or is it the tyranny we impose on ourselves? And I would say probably both. Why not both? The story could be referring to both. We tyrannize ourselves with our own presuppositions all the time. And then you might ask yourself, why? Why don't we just give up our tyrannical presuppositions? You know, because they're not worthy and they're oppressive, but we don't give them up and we often celebrate them. And I think the story has an answer for that too, because it's out of the tyranny into the desert. It's like, is that better or worse? How about worse? And so what if it's the case that even to escape from the tyranny of your own presuppositions that you don't go from the tyranny to the promised land, you go from the tyranny to the desert. And who the hell, excuse me, wants to do that? And the answer is no one with any sense. It's like, hey, I'll just keep the tyranny, thank you very much. At least I know where everything belongs there. And fair enough. I mean, this is a very serious question, and it's, it's an open question in the Exodus narrative whether the desert is worse or better than the tyranny. And so, and you know, you see this in, in the real world. Lots of people in the Soviet Union pined for the days of Stalin. I don't think there's a tyranny that's so brute that we can't long for it if it's been shattered. And so that's quite something, all that packed up in that story. Anyways, you know, the Israelites are out in the desert and uh, they're there for 40 years. And you might think, well, what kind of leadership do they have? It's not that big a desert. And the answer is, yeah, but you know, the desert after a tyranny, that's no bloody joke. And maybe it takes three generations to get through it. And that's possible. And so, there's all that. And then the Israelites are wandering around in the desert. And what happens? Well, the same thing happened to them as is happening to us. They're worshiping false idols and they're tempted. And it's no wonder they're tempted because, well, they're in the desert. It's like it's not going so well. It's no wonder they're having a crisis of confidence, you know, and, and maybe they're pining for the old days and they're not so sure that the God who informed them that being the subjects of tyranny was wrong because now here we are in the desert. And so they lack faith. And it's understandable. But despite it being understandable, and this is one of the harsh things about the story, what does God do when he hears their complaints? He sends poisonous snakes in there to bite them. <laughs> 